I was browsing YouTube one night and I came across this video on iBooks. Sure enough, it triggered a memory. I think I have one of those. I went digging in the attic and I found it. As new MacBook laptops lose their reputation as each day passes, for example, the T key on this MacBook Pro keyboard got stuck during the filming of this video. This is one of the first laptops made by Steve Jobs upon his return to Apple in 1997. And of course, the iconic design is by Johnny Ive. It's one of the first consumer laptops to have Wi-Fi and even a USB port. It even came with this nifty yo-yo charger, which to be honest, I would not mind having on my new MacBook Pro. This iBook is about to have its 20th birthday. So where does this laptop stand today? First off, I researched what upgrades I could put in this thing. It had a 300 megahertz D3 processor, 64 megabytes of memory, and a six gigabyte hard drive. I'm guessing that was the bee's knees back in 1999. Turned out from years ago, I bought an airport card and a battery for it, and both are in working condition. I went ahead and bought a 512 megabyte RAM stick and an SSD upgrade via an enclosure and an M SATA drive. And that's where things got complicated. The iBooks are notoriously hard to upgrade, especially the hard drive. I came across a faster way to access the hard drive to perform the upgrade, and I did it that way, but it didn't work. I went ahead and disassembled the entire computer. I would have hated to be a technician in the 1990s. I had to take the display off and pretty much take everything off the laptop to access the motherboard and the hard drive. Except it still didn't work. So I had to return the products to Amazon and try again a second time with a CF flashcard and a StarTech converter. Except that didn't work. No way was it gonna fit inside the iBook. So I had to return that to Amazon and try another converter. This one by Siba. I finally got it working and for what it's worth, the uh, last time I did this, the time it worked, I actually did it with the quick hack. So if you're going to do this yourself, you can totally use the quick hack. Just make sure you buy the proper components. I restored the original iBook CDs with Mac OS 9 and began using the iBook beginning with this very charming setup screen. The operating system is so old, it's really just a toy to play retro games on it. I played the classic Tomb Raider games and while the early installments ran great, Tomb Raider Chronicles stuttered in high detailed areas. But damn it, I want this thing to have utility and function beyond playing 90s games and applying a cool desktop team. But in no way can this 20 year old laptop do modern tasks and browse the internet. Can it? I think the answer might surprise you. I found out the most recent operating system this iBook can run is Mac OS 10.3.9 Panther, so I went ahead and installed that. It definitely resembles my current laptop more, but I still couldn't get online. Safari didn't work and Camino didn't do much better since it was years since that was updated. It turns out if you hack an iBook without Firewire, you can get OS 10.4.11 Tiger on it, so I did. I got my hands on the disk image for OS 10.4. I copied that disk image to a partition on the iBook. I then performed an open firmware hack and booted into the installation and installed it to another partition on said iBook. After that, it was good to go. But I did do it on USB 1.1, which is like the oldest version of USB ever. And it took hours. To improve performance of Mac OS Tiger on this old iBook, I disabled Spotlight and Dashboard. Disabling those two features dramatically reduced the amount of RAM this computer was eating. You're not going through all this effort for any features Mac OS Tiger has like Spotlight or Dashboard. This is a strategic plan to get access to all the more contemporary software that Mac OS Tiger has access to. I installed all the updates to Tiger and got this thing up to 10.4.11. Again, the biggest annoyance about this entire process is just how slow that USB port is. Transferring a four gigabyte file took an hour. I wanted to see if I could go full L Woods from Legally Blonde on this thing and write an assignment for college on it. I tried and tested three versions of Microsoft Office, Office 2001 Mac OS X edition, Office 2004 and Office 2008. Office 2001 was dated as hell. It made the ugliest PowerPoints and Microsoft Word was really basic. With Office 2004, things did improve. My PowerPoint layouts were still dated as hell, but they weren't incredibly embarrassing and Word did have more features. Office 2008 though is where things really changed. And this is the version of Office you do need Mac OS X Tiger for. I could make modern looking slides and Microsoft Word looked much more similar to what I'm used to on my own MacBook Pro. The experience looked very modern, but it did come at a cost. While it does have a long loading time, it isn't unbearable to use. It is certainly viable, but occasionally there would appear to be input delay as I typed. 
Office 2008 used about four times the amount of memory as Office 2004, and disabling auto spell check actually made the experience worse. I was ready to say that Office 2004 was a happy medium between performance and features, less embarrassing slides and snappier performance. But then I realized something. Office 2008 is the only one compatible with modern documents and PowerPoints. Office 2004 couldn't read my lecture slides and notes, things I and Elle Woods need to succeed in college. But what about the internet? Unlike 20 years ago, basically everything we do now on our laptops and our computers are done in a web browser. For some odd reason, I couldn't see the free open Wi-Fi networks around me, like the university campus Wi-Fi. And as it's one of the first ever laptops to have Wi-Fi, it doesn't connect to networks that have modern encryption, like my iPhone hotspot or my secure home Wi-Fi. Ethernet worked well and I found an app called 10.4fox G3 to use to browse the internet. Modern websites actually loaded and worked, albeit it was slow as hell. But by changing the user agent to Classilla, it would actually show you the mobile version of websites and that surprisingly worked very well. I decided to put a challenge to this iBook. Can it browse all the websites I use on a day-to-day -day basis and that most people use? I could actually use Twitter on this iBook and update my feed and browse Facebook. By using the mobile versions meant for narrow screens, it even allowed me to use both of them side by side. I was able to log into my Gmail to read and send email. With a narrow interface, it allows you to easily copy data from one application like TextEdit into the composition window on Gmail, which was really cool. Google Maps did work and allowed me to get route directions, but this was slow. It actually took around four minutes to get these directions. Whilst it was slow, I could even read memes and articles on BuzzFeed. This was a similar situation with news websites that aren't forgiving to this iBook's 800 by 600 display, and most of them required sideways scrolling. However, I found if you visit the website from Google Mobile, Google can present you with an optimized mobile version. And once again, I was easily able to read news websites. I was able to put them side by side to either take notes or compare and contrast. But the two things I couldn't do, Google Docs and YouTube. I wouldn't even attempt to do the former. Our YouTube videos, while I was able to click on them and open them up in QuickTime Player, the videos wouldn't play. Speaking of video playback, I tried playing videos normally and I couldn't get movie trailer downloads to play, even in a low 240p quality. QuickTime Player played like a slideshow and it was even worse a VLC player, which is surprising as QuickTime has the reputation of being the memory hog. Now this is because modern videos use a H.264 codec, which is not supported by the G3 processor and its instruction set. And even now, H.264 technology is being phased out by the new incoming H.265. I was going to call it there and then. The iBook could do five out of seven most common things most people do on the internet. But surprise, surprise. I came across a forum posting on Mac rumors, which led to a new browser for the iBook. Arctic Fox. This browser runs even better than 10.4 Fox G3, it uses less RAM and everything is snappier. I actually managed to get Google Docs working with this browser, but it was painfully slow. The input lag was like 30 seconds long. However, about after five minutes when the laptop finally processed everything, the input lag was only about two seconds. Again, if you were in a pinch, I suppose you could use Google Docs and maybe just paste in your content into Google Docs to um, use the sharing function. But you'd have to be really desperate. Like you'd have to be stuck on an island and all you had was an iBook and an internet connection to do this. I also played around with the user agent on the web browser and I actually managed to get YouTube videos to play on this iBook. They open in QuickTime and they actually play great. I mean, it's like 240p, so you're not gonna get detailed pictures, but it ran a full 30 frames a second with no stuttering or lagging. I'm actually impressed I pulled this off and it's not as clunky as I thought. I thought there'd be tons of downloading and weird dodgy websites, but no, it's just visiting YouTube and clicking on a video and pressing play. It works great. I tried pushing my luck with high quality video, but that brings you into H.264 Kodak territory and that just didn't work. Music videos, movie trailers, if YouTube has it, the iBook can actually play it on 240p. So the iBook can do everything on the internet, except for Netflix. So far, you know, people will probably come up with a patch for that too. And if that happens, I'll make a sequel video. But besides playing YouTube videos, do you want to know what else the iBook can do? Edit video. I loaded up iMovie 2, which came with sample footage, and sure enough, I sat there and edited a video of these kids giving a dog a bash. Who do these kids belong to? 
I created a 45 second masterpiece and that played great on the iBook as I was using the older H263 codec. Through experimentation, I actually found the best quality export options. 640 at 480 at 30 frames a second with best quality. If you ever add a video on an iBook G3, again, stuck on an island, that's how you're gonna save it. The video playback was absolutely smooth and that's the equivalent of 480p video on YouTube. If you're into 4x3 aspect ratio video, you could totally make a YouTube video on this iBook. The 45 second video did take 6 minutes to export, which is around 8 times the duration of the video. Editing 480p on this iBook is like the equivalent of editing 4K on a 2018 MacBook Pro. All software besides the web browsers featured in this video were retrieved from the Macintosh repository website. I even went ahead and installed a version of Final Cut Pro on this iBook. The benefit of Final Cut Pro was that it allowed you to import all sorts of file formats, like again, those movie trailers. However, it just ran so slow. Even on lowest playback settings after rendering the video, the playback was unbearably, like it just didn't work. So Final Cut Pro is not for this iBook. You will have to use iMovie too. Oh, this iBook is fanless by the way. That's really impressive for 1999. Heck, it's even impressive in 2019. As for other games you can play on the iBook, well, I loaded up the original version of The Sims and that ran great, well, it ran fine, but uh, that just gives you insights into the video games I play. Tomb Raider and The Sims, what a combination, right? I built houses and I destroyed marriages, a real good day's work for this iBook. The battery life on this thing is also crazily good. I got six hours, so yeah. Even though it's very capable, you know, unless you're stuck on a desert island with absolutely nothing but an iBook, I still don't think you're going to be using it day to day. Um, I think it's still for just playing games and playing around with and, you know, having your nostalgia feel. Unless you have a fetish for delayed gratification. If you have a fetish for that, this iBook is great. You'll get plenty of delayed gratification from it. But actually, another reason why I wanted to make this video is actually just to highlight something else. And that's just how much happy and personality this iBook has. With its bright colours and design, it really invites you to mess around and spend hours playing with it. In fact, if you put this iBook beside a new MacBook Pro, you can't deny the strange emotional appeal to the iBook. As Apple moves forward and creates new laptops sooner, hopefully rather than later, I hate that stupid keyboard on my new MacBook Pro, I'd actually advise them to make laptops that are happy and cheerful again. This was created to be the opposite of an old beige computer of the 1990s, but I'm actually starting to believe that we need new laptops to be the opposite of a slab of aluminium. The new iPhone XOR is full of personality and colours, and I do believe their consumer laptops should be the same. Personally, I really like the 2019 Dell XPS. I think it's one of the few laptops on the market right now that looks incredibly happy and inviting to use. As marketing and economists discuss the upcoming Generation Z market, it is pretty well noted that if they're going to own material things and possessions, they want it to be personal. And what's more personal than blueberry and tangerine? This is impressive. This is certainly not how I thought the video was going to go. But as this iBook is about to turn 20 on uh, June 21st, I guess all I really have to say to this thing is happy birthday iBook. You grew up well. I hope you guys enjoyed watching this episode of Insights. Like the video to see more content and subscribe to watch more videos on the channel. Thanks for watching. Bye.